So today we're going to try to address the problems with this FG100 DDS function generator. And if you haven't seen the video regarding what we found with that, I'll leave a link to it up here. And uh, probably a good idea to go and, and check that so that you can get a good grip of what I'm nattering on about here. So I'm going to replace the two uh, fake TL074 op amps in this with these um, na name brand any 5532s that I have here. Yeah, they're both uh, dual ended op amps, so they, they should, uh, you know, they're jelly bean stuff, except for this is slightly higher spec than the TL074. And also their brand name, they're, they're genuine components, they're not, uh, they're not fakes like the, what we have in here. Now I'm hoping I'm going to be able to cut the incumbent operation amplifiers out with this. I may have to use a knife or something like that. But I'm going to cut the chip out first and then I'm going to remove the legs and clean up the pads and then solder these into place. So let's get started with that. I recall this thing is not too difficult to get into. There's four screws here on the back. Got my very important little blinky light thing blinking. You must have uh, every lab of any significance has that blinky light thing blinking. The more blinking lights you have, uh, it, it's a sign of how much more important you are to the, to the world. Okay, and then we need to take the board off. And we, dress, we did address some of the problems already, like mounting the, the display and stuff like that. That's all been, a, that's all been done. And uh, putting an extra screw into the, uh, mounting the board down. It was pretty pathetic. You really should go, View that uh, previous video like this this thing was just a joke um, but bit by bit we've been uh, you know kind of addressing the problems now I want to address the the real elephant in the room and the horrible output from the thing and to do that I'm going to have to break the thing down completely you get those uh, Op amps out and replace them. Now there are the op amps there. So you can see, I mean, it's, it's, we're surrounded by plastic parts and other small SMD devices. So that's why I don't necessarily want to just get a hot air gun in there to cut that, cut those out. So uh, yeah, let's see if I can get this in there and see how effective we can be doing it this way. Okay, that's one side of it is done. Yeah, we've just just ruined it. Just uh, tore the pads off there. Let me go have a look. Yeah, so that wasn't a good method. These uh, this PC board, the traces aren't held down very well. So I've I've torn. It looks like three traces. It's going to be a little bit more difficult, but I can see where everything goes. I should be able to tack it back up and get it working again. Uh, but I'm going to try a different method to get this off. I'm going to have to do that under uh, a magnifying glass though. So I'll, I'll do that off camera and I'll come back and hopefully I won't ruin it anymore. Okay, I got the other one off just fine, getting cleaned up all the pads. And, and uh, I found out where all these other traces go. These two here are actually connected together. And then to this capacitor right here. Let me see if I can get a pointer. goes to this capacitor right here and then to this via. So this is kind of all connected together here. So that should be easy to connect up. I scraped a little bit off that via there so that we could just bridge over some solder. 
And uh, this trace here is still there, so I can I can just bridge over to that as well. And uh, yeah, that was a pretty ham-fisted move. I didn't realize that these uh, traces were so delicately um, attached to the board. I mean, I've done that many, many times without having this problem, but there you go. So, okay, I'm going to try and uh, get those new op amps soldered up there. Uh, again, I have to do that over on my soldering station with a magnifying glass, so I'm not going to be able to show you that particular thing, but I mean, there's all sorts of videos online about people soldering up uh, surface mount stuff, but uh, let me get that done and um, I'll be right back. Okay, um, this one is fine because the pads were okay. I was able to solder that one up nice and easily. This one, it, you know, there were three pads that broke off. Like I say, these two were connected together. So this is, uh, this is just um, a, a unity gain amplifier on this side here. So the output and the, and the negative input were strapped together and going up to this capacitor and also going down through this via to this line here that goes down underneath this pot here. So I put a piece of um, wire wrap wire with the insulation taken off it from here to here to here to down through that hole and soldered it in place. And this one here, uh, the trace was uh, was intact, so all I have to do is just smear a little piece of solder over and bridge that, a tiny gap of about a, a tenth of a millimeter. Uh, it's not it's not as pretty as I'd like it to have been. Uh, so if you, if you go ahead and do this, don't use the, the clipping of the leads. Now what I did to get it off is I very carefully cut the leads with an X-Acto knife on this one, and that's what I should have done over here. Um, another possibility would be to very carefully tape it off with aluminum tape and try to get the, the ICs off um, using a, a hot air gun. Or, uh, you know, like, like I said, this, this one here, I cut uh, all the legs on one side and then I just bridged across here with solder, pushed the chip out of the way, cleaned up everything with um, some solder wick and some isopropyl alcohol, then uh, reattached the new ICs. So let's, uh, let's quickly connect it up before we put it back in the box, just to see um, what kind of waveform we get out of it. Now I know it comes up at 100 kilohertz in sine wave mode. It couldn't do that before. So if, it, if it's able to do that now, uh, we've made progress. So let's, uh, let's hook that up and um, find out. Okay, there's the display in place. Look up an oscilloscope. Okay, let me get the oscilloscope up on the screen for you. Okay, we're ready to apply some power here. Let's see what we get. Now we default it's in stop mode, so we gotta press the run switch here. Oh, that's nice. That's that's very nice. That's what we want. So, uh, despite my butchery, it uh, it seems to be working pretty well now. So let me just get it all bolted back together again, and then we'll we'll run it through some tests uh, against its specifications, and uh, see what we come up with. Be right back. One of the things I will note uh, as I'm putting this back together again, I mean, like getting in there, even even with the display off, uh, it's very difficult. Like this, just seems to be absolutely no room to do anything. Uh, the traces are not robust at all. And uh, yeah, I would say that uh, you know beginners should avoid this, and uh, non-beginners, people who are experienced, should probably get something a little bit better. So uh, my overall impression of it, regardless of whether it works or not, is uh, leave them be. Um, they're not going to. They're not going to be a, a rewarding instrument that you can just take out of the box and use. Uh, now, if you wanted to go ahead and, and develop some skills and you don't mind throwing away the cost of this device, I think by all means go ahead and make the attempt to fix it. Yeah. So let me uh, hook this up now. We'll try it at a few different frequencies and um, waveforms and see what we get out of it. Okay, so according to 
specifications I could find online. Uh, there are various of them, but the most ambitious say that it, it's uh, relatively flat or within 3 dB up to 200 kilohertz on the sine wave. And then for the other waveforms up to 20 kilohertz. And uh, it should be able to produce a reasonable sine wave up to 500 kilohertz. Now, I, I doubt that, but uh, let's, let's have a look. Uh, we'll turn it on again at, at 100 kilohertz. And we see it's got a fairly nice sine wave there. Um, now we'll, uh, we'll just take that and uh, we'll go up to 200 kilohertz and see what we get. Now that's still pretty nice. Into that. Okay. So let's adjust this for that amplitude. And we're at one times probe, one volt. So we're running a six volts peak to peak here. So we've dropped down to 5.2 volts peak to peak. So we're still within 3 dB. And 3 dB would be about 4.2 volts. So let's see how much higher we can go. We've got a pretty decent sine wave there still. I'm going to try it at 350 kilohertz. Let's go to 300. So we'll, uh, okay. Okay, 300 kilohertz. We're at uh, 4.8. So we're still within 3 dB of the 6. And we still got a pretty decent sine wave. Okay, now we're down below three, the 3 dB point, but we still got a uh, fairly decent looking sine wave that's not too horrible let's back it off to 350 and see if that gets us closer to that 3 db point so we can just get a, a good idea of the actual bandwidth of this okay let's uh add a little bit more I can go one more there. It's 375 kilohertz. There we are. Okay, so now we're at the 3 dB point. So up to 375 kilohertz, and we still got a really nice looking sine wave. Let's check it out at 400 and 500 to see what we get. And 400 kilohertz. Still pretty nice. And let's try 450 kilohertz. Now we're getting a bit ugly, but we can produce a signal up here. Let's do the full 500, the full Monty here. Now we can produce 500 kilohertz. Let's see what happens if we try for 600. We can produce 600 kilohertz. It's not really a sine wave anymore, but if you desperately needed a signal at 600 kilohertz, you could and you can get right up to about four volts peak to peak so that's not horrible let's see what happens if we ask it to go at 700 kilohertz oh yeah so that's not really usable for anything there it's got the jitters real bad now we'll try some of the other waveforms they're supposed to be good up to 20 kilohertz so let's uh try square wave and let's have a look at what kind of square wave we can get here. So we can turn this down a bit. Got a bit of jitter in it. It's a, f yeah, it's a fairly decent square wave, I guess. Not terribly good. Let's uh, let's back it down to 10 kilohertz. See if that's a bit better. Yeah, that's naturally a bit better. So I mean, you have, you have a limited rise time there. Let's see if we can measure the rise time here. So our rise time is about a microsecond, and that's going to be really the limiting factor. There's a tiny, tiny bit of overshoot, but I wouldn't be too concerned about that if you're just driving some digital circuitry or something of that nature. But that uh, microsecond rise time is going to be the real limiting factor. Does that improve if we go up? I don't think it will, but let's see if we go up to the 20 kilohertz limit. No, rise time is rise time. Let's try triangle. Oh, that's actually pretty nice. Let's try that up a little bit higher. Still kind of triangular, 
we're getting a little bit more of a sine wave. I guess there just aren't enough harmonics there. Let's uh, back it off down to, we'll try for 50 kilohertz. Well, it's passable. Sawtooth. Now this should be a difficult one to re reproduce. The sawtooth is is as bad as a square wave for harmonics. So let's have a, a look at this. In fact, it's worse. Well, wave shape is not horrible, um, but the uh, jitter is. So let's back it down to 20 kilohertz where they are specifying it. Okay, a little bit of jitter there. I would imagine though that the people who are going to employ this uh, won't mind that much jitter. They're not going to be uh, they're not going to be scientists or physicists trying to get something very very accurate. So I mean, if you were to buy this at the price we paid for it, and it came working like this without you having to get in there and change surface mount operational amplifiers, I'd say definitely worth the money. It's a great little function generator. The user interface is a little bit clunky, but as, unless you're bouncing around like we're doing now, it shouldn't be that much of a pain in the butt. And I do like the DC offset feature. Now if we turn this off, what's our range? You can get a decent amount of offset here. It begins to clip up at the top. So you're just running into the, the ability of the operational amplifier to provide output. And I imagine the same thing's gonna happen down the bottom, yeah. So you got plus or minus 10 volts of, of offset. And you can take it out, be AC coupled. Now what's the filter do? Let's go back to a square wave to see if that filter helps. Now I don't know what's in and what's not. I guess with the switch down it's in. So it does help a little bit if the filter's in at this frequency. Uh, does it do anything for the sine wave at all? So filter in, filter out, filter in. It adds a bit of noise, but it, it also seems to help with the wave shape. Let's go up to 500. Oh yeah, so with the filter in it, it, it does improve. Like you lose a little bit more amplitude, but you do get a, a nicer waveform. But when it switches out, the filter is in. Yeah, if you keep the amplitude, within reason here. 500 kilohertz is not too bad. So what are we putting out here? We're putting out about two volts peak to peak. You know, normally you wouldn't want signals beyond that for most things like audio, you'd be looking at about one volt peak to peak or thereabouts as an input to a power amplifier. As an input to a pre-amplifier, you'd be, you know, running it way down in this neck of the woods. Yeah, I'd say always have it so that filter switches up. I don't see it any benefit in having it the other way. So there were 60, 60 millivolts peak to peak. Uh, then it looks like the, the waveform begins to fall apart a little bit below that. Quite a bit of noise there though. Yeah, in conclusion, it's, uh, it's definitely worth it if you get one that works out of the box. It's not really worth it if you have to go through that surgery. Despite my ham-fistedness worked out, and now we have a, a function generator. And it would be well worth the money if it came like this. Click a like, subscribe, share with all your friends, make me famous. Bye-bye.